all right, so you tell me, how do you think we wound up here where we're kind of having to do this, where we're having to do this kind of discussion where we're, I feel like we're cleaning up a lot of misinformation that's out there. People are speculating, uh, people that are that were not in the hearing are saying a lot of things about the hearing. People that were in the hearing are saying things that are not accurate. Um, how do we get here? Well, there's a lot of background, 30 years of almost 30 years of, of background, but the, the recent background has to do with um, the push in since 2017, 18 to do new DNA testing on the evidence in this case. And a lot of that pressure has come from a media source um, who also got a couple of the defendants on board and campaigned really hard against the state, against the district attorney's office to get this evidence released so that it could be tested. And I think that you and I would agree that the tactics did not work. Yeah, no, it was a complete disaster. Um, Which we've talked about on our show before. Um, the pressure that was put on the district attorney's office amounted to um, bullying, threats, trying to strong arm them into doing um, what they wanted. Yeah, by using a, a worldwide podcast and a major... I guess you can call it a documentary. You and I would probably disagree that it, mm. it wasn't documenting very much. And I'm not trying to, what you know, I'm not trying to cast aspersions to somebody else's work. I wouldn't like it if somebody else did that to us. But, you know, it wasn't much of a documentary. Much of the stuff that was in that documentary was common knowledge and well-known. If you were involved in this case, even researching it, even for a couple of months, you knew all this stuff. So, yeah, it, it's a bad situation um that we constantly kept putting information out to colleagues and friends we know a lot of people close to the case telling people to take a professional tact to approach these people these professionals both in west memphis as well as in jonesboro at the state level as well as the attorneys themselves everybody needed to start carrying themselves like professionals and instead we had doxing bullying and all these other things going on and we were warning people not to do it and so the result of that is what should have been a just a routine request, which I think Ellington was going to do on this case to have DNA testing done using MVAC turned into a complete disaster where Cressman effectively threw up a barrier and said, if you guys are going to act like this, then I'm going to exercise my rights as the prosecutor. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to, we're going to have, we're going to fight this out and we're going to take it to court. This should have been just a routine test, just done. It's probably done all the time. I bet you Cressman has never opposed testing by anybody else. But this case is different because of the fact that we have somebody that went on national television and absolutely resulted in a catastrophic response to the prosecutor's office. Then it was Ellington. And I'm sure that Cressman, his colleague, uh, is not going to put up with it. So... I mean, it is what it is. These guys are high-powered people that are defending their reputations, and Cressman's not going to let himself be pushed around. And Ellington, who already had a judgeship waiting for him, just kind of slid out. And I think Cressman is just holding his position and holding the line against what he considers to be a bully. I think that's what he's doing. And we beg people uh, to not do this, to not behave this way. They, I bet you if they came and just asked cordially, asked nicely, showed that they wanted to work with the prosecutor's office rather than call them corrupt and call them names and dox them and things like this. It would have been a routine situation. We wouldn't be in court at all and we'd be off the race. We might even already have the results. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously probably the most notorious case in West Memphis and Arkansas history. Um, one of the top cases uns unsolved as far as we're concerned in the nation. You know, the notoriety of the case, it's a double-edged sword. It's great to bring it back to the attention of lots of people so that people dig in and look for new information and share new thoughts and ideas and that sort of thing, which is, you know, kind of, kind of what we've done. That's how we got started doing this. We approached it from a different way than anyone else ever has. Um, I think we took a textbook approach when we did it. And that was fundamentally different than what everybody else was doing. Absolutely. 
if these requests had gone unnoticed by the public, if there, if, if it had just been done, you know, in a back room, if it had been a phone call, if it had been a gentleman's agreement over lunch and not had protesters and a letter writing campaign and all this pressure put on the public office, I think there would have been a very different result. Well, I think if the pressure was positive, I mean, the letter camp, the letter writing campaign to write the judge, I think was absurd. That, that was just beyond, that was an absurdity, but there were people reaching out to the judge. Um, Are you talking about for this, this last hearing? Yes, yes. About, okay, I'm talking about to get the, te- the evidence released. I'm oh, sorry. I'm because a lot of those letters were harassment and threats. You're talking about the ones to Ellington. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they were horrible. Yeah, they were horrible. And, you know, we had a conversation with his secretary and she was very scandalized over the nastiness that was coming. I mean, she wasn't getting a lot of love letters, you know, from no. people saying, hey, we think you're doing a great job at the prosecutor's office. It was a lot of hate. Right. Um. And that, and there's, unfortunately, there's still those same letter writers are still writing letters. And trust me, the, the, it's, it's not working the way that people think it's working. Every single one of those is forcing the, the, the prosecutor's hand to say, at the very least, I need to stand against the bullying that's coming out of this. And, um, you know, I, and I don't know what their view is actually on the testing. They might actually be completely ambivalent to the testing. They might not care. Um, right. But the fact of the matter is, is they need to put these bullies in their place. Yeah. And that's how they perceive it. And, and uh, unfortunately, you know, I mean, all I know is, is that some people have claimed that the that Ellington has said that. I know what the secretary said, that it was very unpleasant. Uh, yeah. It was a very unpleasant environment for them to work in. So, so nothing happened while Ellington was in office. Um, that process got slowed down stopped basically and then he left and took his position as judge and um, Keith Cressman became the district attorney to fill um, the rest of Ellington's term so he started in January of 2021 and very shortly after that uh, the pressure started being applied to Mr. Cressman and so then he came out very publicly and said evidence is missing or destroyed. We don't know where it is. It might be gone. Yeah, the interesting thing on those two attorneys, just kind of not to interrupt you, but we we were kind of war- pre-warned that Cressman would be more difficult Yes. than Ellington ever was. Yes. That really our, our chance to really get the testing done without a lot of opposition to just get it right through was through Ellington's office that Cressman was going to be far more... Um, it was going to put up a lot more opposition and that was just kind of his mo that's what he does he's a he's kind of a tougher guy in general and he carries that with him he doesn't i mean we could tell by the fact he carried this all the way to a hearing that he's holding his ground so ellington was was probably the key for them but ellington was treated poorly you're right he took his judgeship and i mean he just kind of drifted into that judgeship and i think he just kind of put everything else down i don't think he cared a whole lot about it. I can't say that I'm terribly happy that that's how he went out, um, but that that's history. That's what he did. And Cressman came in with both guns blazing, and he took on West Memphis three, and and he was going to let everybody know that he wasn't going to be pushed around. And unfortunately, the people in the media decided they were going to try and push him around, and that's what wound up playing out on June 23rd. But let's be clear. Tactics on both sides were wrong here. Um, oh, I agree. The, the media push by the media push against the office was wrong. And this not answering FOIA requests and saying the evidence is lost, that's also just as wrong. It was a certain. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, him, him kind of, you know, whether he was even genuinely meaning that when he actually said, Oh, I think the fire was burned up and police department wasn't promptly responding to the FOIAs and all this other stuff. That was a lot of misconduct, in my opinion. You know, Cressman really should have been stepping up and being the professional there. And instead, the the authorities in West Memphis, and I, I think they probably acted as well as they could. They had to go find the evidence, for crying out loud. 
and kind of show that it was there and, and demonstrate to the Eccles defense team that it was still there and relatively intact. But Keith Cressman, I think, was peddling rumors as and kind of just throwing smoke and just antagonizing the Eccles defense team. And it worked. And it just, I mean, it was an escalation. They were escalating on each other is what was happening. Mm -hmm. I can't say that I was terribly thrilled. I mean, when, when I talk about the, uh, about agitating the, the prosecutor, I'm not saying that it's because I think the prosecutor's right. I just know that the prosecutor's not gonna respond favorably to that um, when he probably responds favorably to what should be just a routine request. So all the evidence is intact and the Eccles defense team decides to file a motion to have what ended up being DNA testing on the ligatures only. And we've discussed this in a previous episode. Um, yeah, no need to rehash that. Right, what the, what the motions the, and then the rebuttal, the reply, we've gone through all of that. So this, the hearing was scheduled for June 23rd, 2022, which was last Thursday at 9.30 a.m. Um, the original court document had it being held in the Marion Courthouse. It actually ended up being held in the West Memphis courthouse. Yes. Which caused some confusion um, yes. to a lot of people, including us. Yeah. And, and, and in fact, uh, Damien Eccles himself, the, the petitioner, um, was spotted at the courthouse by several people. Um, and I think his family was with them or, or his colleagues were with them or something like that. And they, they didn't know where to go. So, but yeah, apparently this is the first time he's been to Marion or West Memphis since his incarceration. So this was kind of a big, I'm sure a big event for him. So we arrived there around 8.30, 8.45 in the morning uh, before the hearing. And we're very closely tied to the Byers family. Of course, you're the victims, one of the victims advocates for the Byers family. Um, I'm one of their science advisors. And we were able to go in and get seated with uh, Mr. George Byers. It's Mark Byers' brother. Um, so when just another piece of misinformation that's out there is that there are were no family members there, um, that's untrue. George Byers was there. He's, he's there representing the interests of his, uh, of his brother's estate. Um, he wants to know what happened to his nephew. He's deeply interested in seeing this resolved. And he's been, he was working with Mark very closely for many years trying to find out what happened to Mark's son. So. Um, it was a pleasure to be with him and to help him uh, with the, you know, with, with his uh, time there in, in the courtroom. So we were able to get in very early on. And one of the things that's very interesting is, is there, was, there was a large police presence there. They were very heavily armed. But this is not atypical of police that are concerned that there might be some type of you know, physical altercation or something like this. And so they, you know, you put on, it's better to be safe than sorry. They put on a bunch of weapons and armor and, and they had everything lined up. They had a, they had a perimeter set up around the, the courthouse. They wanted to make sure the families would be safe. They wanted to make sure Damien was going to be safe because, you know, there are a lot of people that don't like him. So they need to make sure the petitioner was safe. They need to make sure that the victim's family was safe. Mr. Byers, when he walked in, uh, there were media personalities. Some of them were relatively high profile were walking in and out of there. So they set up a safety perimeter. And this was such a highly charged case, given the, the amount of hatred and doxing that probably went on uh, with Mr. Ellington and probably is also going on with Mr. Cressman. I'm sure that the, uh, that the security concerns of Judge Alexander weren't unwarranted. I'm sure that they were just a little nervous. They didn't know what was going to be coming. And so they were prepared. I will tell you that the officers that we ran into were respectful. They were kind. They were trying to carry about their, they were trying to do their duty. Um, they wanted to make sure that justice was carried out and that everybody felt comfortable. I at no point ever felt like they were trying to do anything malicious or to harm anybody. I never got that feeling from Judge Alexander, who we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, I felt it was a great environment. Um, it was hospitable. The first person that I saw uh, there in the parking lot, I saw Jason Baldwin, of course, Damian Eccles was there. Um, and there was uh, lots of media. There was, it looked like there was a documentary film crew and probably between 50 and 70 supporters. Is, do you, would you agree with those numbers? I do. And I also want to make it clear um, 
there were not hundreds of supporters. There was a good number there, but yeah, somewhere, because it's hard to tell who all was media, but a total number of people in the parking lot at around 75, um, I think is a, is a good ballpark number. And a number of those would have been media, but also I haven't heard anyone point this out. There was no one there in opposition. Everyone that was there was a supporter of Damien. Everyone that was there wanted this evidence to be released, to be tested. There was, I did not, there were no, there were no people on the other side. There was nobody there saying, judge, don't do this. I didn't see anybody. I didn't see any signs. Everybody was in one group. There were no separate groups. There was no fighting among the people that were there. Did you see any of that? No, no. I mean, this was probably a typical supporter rally. I mean, they're always very positive and very uplifting and they're great people and they're really out to try to get justice. I mean, Damien and Jason and Jesse definitely uh, deserve to have their 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 grievances heard and to try to get this these answers done. I know that's why Mr. Byers was there. He, He wants to know what happened to his nephew, just like Damien does all the others. So the supporters out there were great. Um, I think they got caught a little flat footed with the with the heat, but they were out there with the police officers who were wearing full body uniforms in that same heat. I'm sure they weren't very happy about it either. And I I think there was just kind of mutual misery during the court hearing for those that weren't able to get inside. Yeah. And and I wanted to say another thing, too. I think our perspective is a little bit different because we were with a family member of a victim. Um, So I appreciate that. We didn't have to wait outside. Um, When we arrived, we were told we were going to be the first people allowed in. So we basically parked and walked straight in. We had to wait a few minutes before um, we could go through security, but we didn't have to wait outside. The police were very gracious. They were very nice. They were very helpful. We talked to a couple before we even got parked um, and they were very nice to us. Um, So I've heard that some people were not treated well. I I can't speak to that because we weren't outside. We didn't witness any of that. Um, But our experience with the police officers who were there was very positive. Yeah, I thought it was a professional operation. It seemed like they were just putting safety first. They weren't going to take any risk with anybody getting hurt or any issues going on. This is a very, very polarizing case for some people. Uh, It's, you know, you never know when a non-supporter says, hey, this guy should be in you know, should, should have been on death row. So I'm going to take matters into my own hands. And, you know, and judge Alexander, of course, was probably receiving lots of emails and mail. And I bet you a lot of it wasn't pleasant. Um, So, and I'm sure she's getting stuff now after the fact that isn't pleasant. So I think everybody was a little bit on edge. Remember this thing has been dormant for 11 years and uh, you know, and by the way, saying that there's only 50 to 70 supporters that showed up is not a, an indictment on the concerns be, on behalf of the supporters. There. No, it was horrible weather. It was absolutely horrible. And it's expensive right now. And it's difficult. And there's issues with COVID going on. And so it doesn't mean that that supporters didn't want to be there. And they weren't there in spirit. They haven't voted with their money. And they didn't buy shirts. They were passionate, the ones that were out there. But boy, is it's a real sacrifice to get out there on a what well, that was a Thursday morning in the middle of the summer. I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a hard hearing to make. Yeah. And I think all of our listeners know, but we're also supporters, right? We support the, we support the West Memphis three. Um, we want justice for Stevie, Michael and Christopher. Absolutely. Um, I think it, the, uh, the only difference for us that day was that we were there representing the family of a victim, but we were also supporting, we, we want at some point the DNA testing done. It has to be done. It's necessary. At some point, this all has to, the public deserves answers. Absolutely. Once everybody's kind of escorted into the courtroom, there seems to be some degree of controversy over who's getting in, what's going in. Now, we were in there first. We were seated behind the prosecutor's dais. We were able to see the entire thing. They, By the way, the prosecutor and the petitioner were not mic'd. Neither was the judge. So sometimes you had to really listen hard to be able to hear what was going on. But we were in there and we were seated six feet apart from one another. Uh, Mr. Byers was actually sitting right in the middle. We were sitting on the sides of him. To, and then, to explain a little bit to the listeners. So it, you walk in, there's a center aisle. And on each side, there's a row of benches or pews. There were nine on each side. The front two benches on each side were shorter by about two feet. Um, and then the, and then the rest of the eight behind those were all the same length. And I estimated it about 12 feet for the benches 
that were in the back um and they were social distancing and masking um interestingly i did not notice and maybe you did when we went into the west memphis courthouse i don't know i didn't see a sign for masks but i wasn't looking for one however when we went by the marion courthouse they did have a sign up that said masks were required to enter and that is the courthouse where judge alexander typically works when she's yeah. in the area yeah somebody had verbalized that she was very big on on this issue of disease control yes. lots of health uh, concerns it, i think health concerns and i don't remember who articulated that to us at this point i remember, I remember. it was a male somewhere um but so we we knew that we had to be masked it was pretty clear that that had to happen and that's going to play a role uh kind of right at the very beginning of the hearing there was kind of a, a, a kerfuffle about that um but we were in there they they seated a large number of members of the media uh in fact it was interesting sitting across several people whom i did not know uh look over to my right and behind me and then see them on the news later on giving the mm -hmm. story so it was pretty pretty interesting there's a lot of press credentials in there which is a good thing because the public now has eyes in there in an environment where the judge is very has, clearly has anxiety about people spreading disease uh and, and almost certainly she the references to covid right so uh, she never said it she didn't bring that up but she did in, she did enforce the mask mandate and she did enforce uh social distancing and, and I, I would just like to comment on that as well um because that has been brought up a lot um, that I've seen in the last few days, that the state did not have to mask, but the defense and everyone else in the courtroom did. Um, that's actually not uncommon. And the reason for that is that all of those people, or most of them anyway, are outsiders. They've come from other places and they're bringing their germs with them. Um, so if the, if the state doesn't Feel like they need to mask because they're around all these people that are from out of town that's fine and it's also very typical that it's necessary to see someone's face and especially not being miked that they need to have freedom to talk and to be heard and so a mask prohibits that and so from the courtrooms i've been in i've only been in a couple since covid but that's actually pretty standard that the state and even the defense and the judge, the clerk, the people that are in the front of the courtroom are not masked. Um, so I, I don't know that that's odd. It didn't seem odd to me, but I know that I've heard other people point out that that was odd. Um, yeah, and I just to, I, I want to bring up Patrick Banka, the the attorney for the petitioner, Damon, Damien Eccles, was also not masked. Correct. So, but but she did mandate that Damien wear a mask. Yes. And which he complied with. Yes. Um, and, and he didn't he didn't seem to be upset or irritated about it in any way, shape, or form. He was respectful. He sat up in the front of the room, um, as well as his associates. So, I mean, so, but we'll get to Patrick and, and Damien's entrance here in a little bit. It's kind of an important thing that seems to come into some controversy because there's some misunderstandings about what happened. Uh, so we were in there, they seated the media in there. It was very quiet. There was almost no chatter in there. It was a very quiet room. Um, uh, Keith Crespin was there early, uh, right around nine. Ten, in fact, the entire prosecutor's team was sitting there at the dais ready to go when we walked in at 845. It was um, about 850 by the time we got into the courtroom. Itself. It was about 815 when mm -hmm. we got yep. through. So, but I mean, they were clearly there. They were ready and they yes. were just waiting for court to start. Correct. Um, at 920 I actually made a note in because I took very careful and meticulous notes including times for when things happen at 920 um Patrick Banka walked in and I believe he, he did not have Damien Eccles with him at that time Correct. Damien would, would come up a few minutes later and they began to he began to confer with uh Keith Cressman about some of the things that were the topics that were going to be discussed and they were showing each other documents this is this is pretty typical. And then it became very clear that the people that were going to be coming in were going to be required to wear masks. And so there was a big question about how to get masks out to everybody. Can they, can they, I guess they, he mentioned that he might want to pause the court really quickly so he could make sure that the people that he wanted to get in had masks. Um, and I, I, I mean, it was kind of hard to see what was going on, but this was all happening before 930. So between 920 and 930, there was a lot of activity going on between the prosecutor, uh, Keith Cressman, and the petitioner's attorney, 
Patrick Banka. Mr. Binka asked Mr. Cressman about the masks. And if, I mean, I was listening intently to this conversation and said, you know, I understand that you're supposed to have a mask to come in. Is there any way we can lift that? The people that I need to come into the courtroom do not have masks and or, or could masks be provided. Mr. Cressman then spoke with a security officer who was at the front of the court. That officer went out of the courtroom to what I'm assuming to chambers to speak with the judge and came back and said, I'm sorry, they have to wear masks. Everyone, you know, that's attending has to wear a mask. And he said, well, I can send one of my people down to Walgreens and buy a box of masks. Yes. Yes. Was the conversation that. that I heard. So then he, I think he actually left the courtroom. Yes, he did. I don't know if he went out the front or out the back, but he did produce a stack of masks he, when he returned. He, yeah, he went outside and then came back. Yeah. And at that point, people were seated. And um, and that was right before 930, right at about 930 when that happened. People were so, steadily coming in. We did recognize a lot of faces and then there were a lot we didn't know. And a lot of them were obviously media, you know, based on their notes and notebooks and um but we saw um, Jason Baldwin came in, Mara Leverett came in, um, Damien's wife, um, their investigator came in. Yeah, that's that's who I'm kind of remembering to, to some extent. I mean, the main thing I was paying attention to was what was going on in the front of the room. I actually yes. didn't know Jason was in there until I'd walked out of the courtroom. Yeah. Um, so what essentially ended up happening, just to, to finish painting this picture for you, is that um, there were there were benches skipped so the first bench had people on it then there was an empty bench then the one behind it was seated then there was an empty bench every other row was empty for social distancing and then the benches that were seated had social distancing of about six feet between people which ultimately allowed about three people to sit on each bench so our back of the envelope estimate for the number of seated observers how many do you think well You've got 16 benches at three people and then two benches at two. So whatever that math is. <laughs> that whatever that number is, which I'm not going to. That's 40 at 52 people. Yeah. Total. Is it that many? Is it what do you think it was that many? Um, I, I, my estimate without doing that math, I was going to guess 45 to 50 people. Yeah, it felt would like have, that. that would have been my guess. Yeah. As to how many people were in the courtroom. And of course, there was also witnesses in the courtroom, the expert witnesses. It wasn't mm -hmm. just going to be the petitioner's witness. It looked like Keith Cressman had at least one a very yes. high profile witness that was in there. Yes, um, he was seated right in front of us. Yeah, and that and anybody who's familiar with the case is familiar with the name Kermit Channel or mm -hmm. Channel, I think is how he pronounces his last name. I've always pronounced um, it Channel. I might be wrong. It, it probably is Channel, I think. Um, but Kermit was there and um he was getting ready to provide testimony. So it's very clear that the prosecutor showed up with the intention of not just trying to win on a technicality. He probably didn't think that that was going to happen. So that's, that kind of indicates that they all recognize that there was a path through mm -hmm. this uh, early discussion that we're going to have to talk about here in a minute um, to get yeah, to talking about the science. It was not a foregone conclusion that she was not going, that she was going to reject this motion. Absolutely not, because the state was prepared. They had their own witness. So yeah. they wouldn't have brought him to court if they knew in advance that this wasn't going to go anywhere. Yeah, there, there, there seemed to be no, I mean, just based upon the setting itself. So can we introduce uh, Judge uh, Alexander? I mean, you've got, some, you've got some bio stuff on her. She's interesting. She's a very interesting person. Yeah, um, I mean, I don't have it right in front of me, so I'll just tell you just briefly what I remember I was just curious about who she is as a woman I talked to a few people um who knew of her um one person who actually knows her um worked with her when she was actually a practicing attorney spoke very highly of her said she was very fair um and that she worked very zealously for her clients as an attorney and thought that she um was an excellent judge and so I was happy to hear that prior to going into the hearing um and then I just read a couple of articles about her just out of curiosity. And so I found out that she is the first female black judge in that district, um, which in this day and age, I find kind of appalling <laughs> that she's, I mean, I'm happy that she's the first, but I, I had no idea that in 20, well, she was, she became a judge in 2016 or 2017. I can't remember she, which. I think she was elected in 2017. 2017. Um, but still, that's only five years ago, right? 
Yes. You'd have thought that there was a black female judge prior to that, or I would have anyway. Um, so that was, that was pretty interesting. So she had a really interesting childhood. She saw some injustices, which made her decide that she wanted to become an attorney and give everybody an equal chance um, and to apply the law fairly. That's what, you know, she said she wanted to do. And like I said, we're supporters. Um, we want to see this evidence tested. And after being in that room, it's easy to say, you know, she's towing the line. She's doing what the district attorney wants. She's doing what Arkansas has always done. Nothing could be farther than the tr from the truth. In my opinion, I was there. I heard her. I think that what I read about her and what I've been told about her is true. I think she's very fair. Yeah. So, you know, we came at it with, without the emotional veil of being, uh, you know, a def, you know, helping the defendants or anything like this, we were coming in there sitting next to a victim's uncle and trying to answer questions. He just wants answers for questions that he and his family have always had. And, um, you know, so we were coming at it from a little different angle. So I could see why there's a lot of anger. Anger kind of manifests from emotional uh, expectations. Um, so I, I think that's one of the advantages to having, you know, not only the media in there, but having people like Mr. Byers in there, who, by the way, was disappointed by the verdict, which or by the finding of the judge. But we're, we're going to talk about this here in a minute. So uh, in terms of your, your, your opinion of her, and I'm sure it matches exactly what mine was, uh, she walked in there. She was in control of that of that court. She was called to order right at 930. She was very not prompt. late. Mm -hmm. She was very prompt. She wasn't going to put up with any nonsense. <laughs> um, she was tough. She was articulate. And she was exceedingly intelligent. And anybody who would say that she came in and she was unfair or she was biased or she was, uh, you know, she had made up her mind does not know anything about what happened to that courtroom or they are sitting there with their own emotional bias and it's clouding their judgment because i will tell you she came in there she did she did a very good job of trying to referee what is a very very difficult and emotional situation and i think anybody saying that she came in with a bias or something like that is not paying attention she articulated point after point after point of opportunity for the petitioner to deal with the questions at hand. And, you know, as you and I observed, that was not handled well. Um, we're probably going to be the first ones to say that. Um, and that's not going to make us very popular. But, you know, the transcripts are going to be public soon. And people could read it with their own eyes. And they're going to say, well, wait a minute, this didn't go down the way that I thought it went down. They said it happened like this in the courtroom. And it didn't happen like that. In so fact, that's the reason why we're recording this. Just an interesting aside, while we were observing what was going on in the front of the courtroom before the hearing started, um, and I know you caught this too, Mr. Cressman had put a couple sheets of paper stapled together on her desk. And when she entered the courtroom before she started, actually, you know, the court was called to order before she started the hearing, she picked it up and said, who put this here and threw it. Yeah. And Mr. Cressman was like, oh, it was me. You know, I'm sorry, Your Honor, kind of thing. Well, and so I thought. It was actually even more offensive than that because he said he had done it and then she threw it. Yeah. And so I thought. It wasn't oh, like she was any fan of Keith Cressman. No. She was, exactly. She and that's like exactly that. what I thought. I was like, okay, so they are not buddy buddy or whatever. Or, she, or he should have known better than to behave this way in her courtroom. Right. That it was clear she didn't want anything on her desk. Absolutely. I, I, she took it as a clear form of disrespect. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Sorry, it was just an aside that I haven't heard anyone mention. No, it's it, it happened. That's yep. what happened before the hearing even started. So she called it to order. And the first thing she brought up was venue, if I can recall, it was yes. venue. And then she said there are two hurdles. And so but, the way, yeah, go ahead. Let's talk about venue for just a second. Sure. Because that was potentially an issue. Um, Cressman in his rebuttal to the motion said that it was filed in the wrong venue. Uh, that it should have been in Craighead County instead of Crittenden County. So that was, an, you know, and, and supporters of Damien said, no, that's ridiculous. Of course, it was filed in the correct court. And then I've even heard that it was resolved at this hearing and that it was filed in the right court. That is not what happened, is it? Nope, that's not what happened. What happened is they had a discussion and the judge said, 
I know there's been some talk about this. It really doesn't matter because I'm a circuit court judge and I travel. So I can either hear this here in West Memphis or I can hear it in Jonesboro where I'll be next week or the week after or whatever. And we can do the hearing there. So it really doesn't matter to me if it's in the wrong venue or not. And then she said, ask Mr. Crestman if it was an issue for him. And he said, no. And they moved on. Never was it said whether or not the papers were actually filed in the correct or incorrect venue. Was that, yeah. did you hear that? Cause I didn't. Yeah, no, she didn't. She never ruled one way or the other. She, she said, didn't. what difference does it make? You're going to get me either there or here. Might as well just do it now. Correct. Which it's not really, it doesn't really matter except that there are people who are saying that the motion was filed in the correct place and the judge said so. And that's not what happened. Yeah. The yeah, judge did, did not say. She didn't say either way. She didn't knight somebody as a winner in that. Correct. At all. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. She just basically said, let's just cut through it and just get to the common sense. Hey, I'm, you're going to get me either way. We're here. Let's do it. Yeah. You know, she didn't even say, let's do it. She's like, do you want me to do this? And yeah. they said, yeah, let's both sides agreed. Let's just do it. Correct. It was a non-issue. My only point is that there wasn't a winner. Yeah. There was no declared winner by the judge. Yeah. Yeah. So again, no bias. Correct. So then she said, uh, and she brought them up. It was not raised by Keith Cressman verbally. She was aware of the situation. She made it very clear that she knew what was going on, what was on, on the docket. She was in control and she didn't, she just anticipated exactly what was going to come. And she brought up the two hurdles. The first one is the one that immediately was the one that caused all the problems. So what was that first hurdle? Um, the type of petition that was filed, which was a habeas petition. Um, it was a petition for DNA testing, but falls under the habeas statute in Arkansas. Yeah, she brought that up right away. It was kind of the, uh, it was the elephant in the room. Right. So she, and, she, yeah, go ahead. No. So she informed the defense that there were two hurdles and that they had to clear both of them, not just one, but both of them in order to proceed with the hearing that was scheduled for that day, which would have been to look at the scientific evidence um, pertaining to MVAC testing. So it was clear to me anyway, as an observer, that um, this was a surprise to Mr. Binka. He was not expecting this um, to be brought up by the judge. Um, that the, the that there was an issue with the type of petition that was or filed, that she was, or that she was going to declare it a hurdle at Correct. all. It seemed like he he didn't seem to take it seriously going in, and he didn't seem to be prepared for this very question. And, and I, I know that he, people have been saying that he articulated these great arguments on the on the stand, and he did make points, but they weren't legal points; these were philosophical points. And she brought that up, but yeah, I just wanted to make that little interjection right there. Yeah, and, and that's, I read after the fact that the defense assumed that because um, a hearing was set to hear oral arguments on this, that they didn't think that the type of petition was an issue. Otherwise, she would not have set a hearing. And so that may have been the reason that they were not prepared um, to argue this even though it was brought up as an issue by Mr. Cressman in his rebuttal to their motion. Yeah and she gave them a lot of leeway to argue that by the way. She didn't immediately say I'm not convinced you Correct. know motion denied. She didn't say any of that stuff. She continued to hit the ball back. There was an extremely important I would say pivotal point in that conversation uh, well, we should probably bring up what Mr. Benka said, because the, she brought up a pivotal response to that with respect to previous arrangements with Ellington. And that's where it seemed to be very clearly the wheels were coming off. Well, let's, um, let's back up just a minute. She started by reading the statute, yes. word for word, what the statute says. And it's very clear in the Arkansas statute, it's very narrowly defined as to who is eligible to bring a habeas petition. And that only includes those who are in custody and in custody being defined as incarcerated or on probation and parole. Yeah. She even cited case law that Correct. backed that up. So it wasn't just something she just pulled out of her ear and said this is what i think i'm gonna i'm gonna interpret it narrowly she's gonna say it's, it has been interpreted narrowly 
And that's what the law says. I have to follow that. Explain to me why this, you know, why I need to deviate from this. And she gave Mr. Banka a very wide berth to make that argument. And his argument isn't, there was nothing wrong with his argument. It just wasn't legally sufficient for the judge. You know, he explained all the ways in which someone who has been convicted or who has has pleaded guilty um, still continues to suffer after that. Now, these are three men who have maintained their innocence the entire time. They took these pleas in order to get out of prison after serving for 18 years. And whatever I think of that or you think of that, it wasn't our decision to make. They made the decision that they felt was, you know, the best for them. And they were on parole for 10 years and got off of parole last year. And so they are technically no longer in custody in any way, shape or form to the state of Arkansas. Um, and, and Mr. Binka's argument was, well, they have these reputations. They can't get the jobs that they want. They might not be able to, you know, buy a home or buy a car or, do things that, that everyone else uh, that doesn't have those kinds of convictions on their record that we're free to do. And, and so they can't participate in the economy and they can't travel in the same way that free people can. Correct. And it affects them deeply. Yes. Yeah. There are lots of limitations because of these convictions. And it's not that the argument is wrong. Mr. Benka wasn't wrong. He's right in all of those things. I think in my opinion, he's all of those things are valid but they're not legal arguments, at least yeah. not in the state of Arkansas. Yeah, she, and in fact, the judge said, you know, given what I have in front of me and based upon the precedent that is before this court, I can't be concerned about your existential incarceration. I have to be worried about actual incarceration and your client is not in the penitentiary. Correct. He's not incarcerated. So that's that's where that sticking point came up but she did bring up he did bring up in his conversations very quickly that they had a previous arrangement to uh with mr ellington's office where they weren't going to contest this as as a as a verbal part of the alford plea uh that they that mr ellington had agreed to make the to, to preserve the evidence and to make it available for testing if the occasion should arise and she immediately latched onto that. She did not shut that down at all. She opened the door for that. And she was, it was almost kind of like, hey, let me have this. What do you have? She looked at him right in the face and said, what do you have? And he said, well, uh, is it, she said, is it in writing? And he said, well, uh, it's in text messages. It's in phone calls. It's on video. Um, it can be found. And she said, do you have it with you? Can you produce it for me right now? Can you produce it? Yes. Can you produce it for me right now? And she, and honestly, I was shocked. He didn't have it. Right. So he, he said, said he could ask for a continuance actually was his response. Yeah. Yeah. He would have to ask for a continuance or he might seek a continuance or something to that extent. And um, you could see she kind of sat back in her, in her chair. And I felt that she had a disappointed look in her face. Like if you could give me that, then we don't have to talk about a habeas thing. This is more of a contract dispute then. Um, but that's, he didn't provide it. He didn't pursue that. And the conversation very rapidly changed. I felt that was one of his golden opportunities to get that done. And he didn't have it on him. I felt that that was, that was a mistake. Honestly, if he had asked the court for like a 10 minute recess, we could have given that to him. There are multiple people in that courtroom who could have gone outside because we didn't have our cell phones. There were no, nothing electronic allowed in the courtroom, no recording devices. So none of us had cell phones on us. Um, now they did have laptops, like at the defense table, he had a laptop and probably his cell phone, but we weren't allowed to have them. But there were a number of people there who could have provided that information, I feel sure. Yes. In a matter of minutes, could have found that for him. Yeah, it, it's very prominently displayed in the University of Arkansas speech that Ellington gave after the release of the West Memphis Three that's available at several locations on YouTube. So yeah. it's it shouldn't have been a, a challenge for them to be able to provide it, but they, he just didn't seem to be concerned with that argument as a strong argument, or he just didn't have it on him. And he continued to pursue the, uh, he, he then made the argument of what does it mean to be incarcerated or what does it mean to be- uh, Free. What does it mean to be free? Hmm. 
Um, and she said the, the legal limits or the legal language that I have in front of me is not based upon your definition of free. And he said that we feel that the, the definition being applied here is unconstitutional. Now, of course, once he did that, we knew that the wheels had come off. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, Patrick was, or Patrick Banco was doing a poor job in terms of articulating that it might be, it might in fact be unconstitutional. He might be absolutely right. But uh, once you know you're going into court, and you're making those kinds of arguments, you're, this is an uphill battle, big time. And you could feel the kind of the wind deflate, coming out of the room at about that point. He, it, it felt like he didn't have a strong, uh, pragmatic and obvious argument to go ahead and throw at the judge to say, we can clear this first hurdle based upon this simple explanation. Yeah. And I think she was looking for that. I think she, I think the door was open for that. And he just didn't have it. Well, and in um, fact, after after they had that brief conversation and he said he didn't have any kind of evidence to back that up, I wrote down, she said, then it's irre irrelevant. You have two parameters for this habeas petition. That's right. I remember and then that. they went on. Yeah, yeah. And she kept saying it was irrelevant. I do remember that. Mm. So, I mean, yeah, because it's all hearsay at that point. Yeah. Um, she, then, she then did actually articulate that there were two ways to get what he wanted for his client. He did, she did not shut the door down uh, on that. She continued to talk about it. And you're starting to hear a lot about that social media. Uh, one of them is kind of a canned, I think it's a canned response that comes from a lot of judges. I know I've heard it in other cases where they say, well, if you don't like the law, you can always go to the legislature and you can change, change that. And of course, that is a remedy. That's a very hard remedy. And I'll tell you why it's a hard remedy. It seems it seems commonsensical to go to the Arkansas legislature and say, by the way, you know, there's cracks and people are falling through the cracks. So let's seal those cracks and fix this. What's going to happen is the Department of Corrections at, at, uh, in Arkansas is going to come and say, well, now we're going to get flooded. If you change the law, we're going to get flooded with all these petitions. We're going to get buried in court. It's going to be expensive. It's going to be difficult. And the whole purpose for this very restrictive language is to make sure that we don't get completely bogged down based upon our limited resources. And because it's legislative rather than judicial, the legislature who is the keepers of the purse for the state of, of Arkansas are going to take that under consideration. And Arkansas tends to wax a little conservative when it comes to the Department of Corrections. Hmm. So I would assume that that's going to be a hard fight, but it does sound like early rumblings, uh, especially out of the Eccles camp, that that might be the direction that they're heading is to try to change the law um but i i mean honestly it, I, if they were to produce the fact that they had an agreement with ellington i think that they would have i think they would have heard the science at that point i think it would have happened very quickly right after that um and then she brought up that there was the the third option which is the one that uh, we've been advocating for which is you go for testing uh based upon new evidence that is brought into the case so if there's something that is already there and the new evidence that is already in lockup that's in west memphis pd's uh, locker room um can support those findings then at that point you have an avenue in that direction as well and she brought that up she said that's the way you can go and the reason why that's important is because the and banca admitted this uh, right before the judge we acknowledge that this will not exonerate our clients and that's the crux of that whole thing. So if, unless it's going to exonerate or lead to an exoneration potentially, then all you're doing is just mining the evidence without, a, without an agreement, without producing an agreement. And that's where the wheels came off. And you could tell that the judge had no legal way to get them through. I don't feel like she shut them down. I think she was frustrated that the ball kind of got dropped so severely. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I think she was hoping that they would come back with a um, substantial legal argument, something that she could say, okay, absolutely. I think this applies. Um, let's move forward. I think that's what she was hoping to do. I think there was disappointment on her face. Yeah. She seemed to be disappointed and she seemed to be. Yeah. And she, yeah. And then she, of course, she dismissed the motion. I mean, it was, uh, it was uh, unfortunate, but I don't feel like, I don't feel like she had a choice because yeah. because she would she would have to in terms of her reputation if she had granted it nonetheless then Keith Crestman would have appealed 
of course. Or would have objected. And, and if her like, reputation is now on the line, and by the way, judges' reputations mean everything in these courtrooms. If they don't yeah. have their reputation, then they're not in court. She she's point blank said the court cannot carve out an exception that does not exist. And then she said, appeal this decision. Please appeal this decision. And if the appellate court sends it back, I will grant testing. Yes. If I'm wrong, does. I will do this. Yes. But based on the law, the way it is right now, the case law that she has to to rule by, she didn't have a choice. Her hands were tied. And so she said, please appeal this. And so can we add some context to another thing that's floating around? Yes. Where they said that she looked over at Damien or Damien's attorney and chastised him for accepting the Alford plea. That's not what happened at all. No. Uh, yeah. Do you want to go ahead and say that? Because I know. Well, I mean, I wrote it down in my notes because I, I took a lot of notes. <laughs> um, but she did. She looked at, at Damien and said, you could have had a new trial, but you took the Alford plea and there have been no petitions on your case in 11 years. And I, it wasn't that the way she said it, it wasn't, she wasn't condemning him. She wasn't saying he made the wrong choice in taking the Alford plea. I think it was, it's taken a while for this petition to get here and you weren't prepared. Like if you were going to take 11 years to bring this petition to the court, I expected more. Bring me yeah, something I, think, I can approve. Yeah, I think that there was some element of that, but it certainly wasn't her shouting down Damien. No, not at all. Not only that, she's saying you took the Alfred plea, but also in the context of you took the Alfred plea knowing that that would shut down certain options for you. So you knew yes. that that was going to be a problem. There are other avenues and you haven't pursued those. So pursue, you know, that seemed to be the context that she was going at. And had you served me any of those other options, and and by the way, when you look at the social media accounts of, of some of the people tied to this, I mean, I feel bad for Damien not getting this because this is something he really needed done. I, I, Jason needed it done and Jesse needed it done. And the victims need it done. Yeah, they all wanted it done. And I think that ultimately it's going to get done. I think it's going to happen. But, you know, like I said, we talked about earlier, um, when you go after the prosecutor in a really nasty bullying way, he's not going to play ball. Yeah. He's going he's to make you fight for it. He's going to make you fight every inch of it. After, after she went through that, she said, you need to find another way to get this DNA tested. Habeas does not apply. That's it wasn't, right. she, she's clearly, she's encouraging them to go for other avenues. She wants them to find another way to bring this DNA testing about. It wasn't, you're out of luck. This is the end of the road for you. you. Habeas doesn't apply to your case. Therefore, you're done. You, you've lost all hope. This is it. It wasn't that way at all. She, she gave them suggestions on how to proceed. And she was basically saying, please do these things. Please do these now, things so now, that you can keep going. Now, let's, let's be frank in how her demeanor was. She was not, she was not humble. No, 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 no. Yeah, she, I, I, she I'm was. getting excited about this, but she she was very um, calm, even keel, um, to the point. Very. I would, say, I would say she was both calm and stern at the same time. She was, yes, but and and let's for for just one second too, for both sides. Now, Mr. Cressman barely opened his mouth during the hearing because he didn't have to. Um, when he was asked a question, he basically said, "I rely on, you know, my." reply to the motion and sat back down because <laughs> he didn't really have anything he had to say but I don't she think he said 30 words the entire hearing correct but she she was she was that way with both sides what well, little interaction she had with mr cressman it wasn't just for damien's side yes yeah yeah and i i don't think that she showed any favoritism towards mm -mm. cressman at all I, no. I mean you hear that all the time that like there's some kind of collusion happening between the judge and the prosecutor to keep that there was no evidence of that at all. And like I, like you mentioned earlier about the paper, she that was, by the way, off the record. That was before she even called it to order. She had already, uh, Cressman had already kind of crossed her. Yeah, so that was my that was my read on her is that she was um, very deliberative. She was extremely articulate and intelligent. 
And I also want to make one more comment. She did not suffer fools lightly in that courtroom on either side. Um, at one point, um, she, I mean, we already talked about what happened with Cressman, but at one point, Patrick Banka endeavored to try to educate her on the history of the, of the case. And she just raised her hand and said, I've read all 4,000 pages of court testimony in this case. I know it inside and out. You don't need to educate me on anything. I know what's going on here. Yeah. So, um, and that, that put that, you know, down right there. So she, she's got an understanding of what's going on. She knows what her predecessor's rulings were and why they were what they were. And um, I mean, she made it very clear, this was her independent ruling. This is not coming from some other side area. And in the end, when you follow what she was dealing with, you know, one of the big arguments that, that that's now kind of raging online and probably will rage for a couple more months is whether or not, uh, you know, the request for testing, whether or not that resides outside of the of the Arkansas code for habeas corpus. And of course, it's in the habeas corpus code. That's mm -hmm. where it is. Yeah. And she brought that up. She says, you know, they said they read the code and saying, you know, all persons that have received convictions. And she said, yeah, but where is that? And he said, well, it's under this section. You know, she went over the whole thing. And she goes, what is it called? And he goes, habeas corpus. Mm -hmm. And she said, exactly. You know, so it, it, it was frustrating to watch this all play out because honestly, had they showed up with their A game, I think and, and I think that they would have sat down and had a discussion about the science. And uh, there was apparently a second hurdle. You're gonna have to remind me what that second hurdle is because I always forget what it was and I didn't um, write it down. Yeah, because we haven't gotten there yet, but it was um, the case of Johnson versus Arkansas. Johnson versus Arkansas, yes. Yeah, um, a couple of things. She did, just to be, transparent about what happened in the in the hearing um there was a point when mr Binko was trying to explain why damien is in fact not free and um and the judge said to him i follow the law and statutes not public opinion i don't like grandstanding and i'm not saying that you are but you can get there real quick <laughs> so she did she didn't she didn't like and then she made you know like you had said earlier another comment about you know existential reasoning and you know that's not the law <laughs> um she was very by the book and yeah. i think that if he had presented a good legal argument for testing even though Damien is not incarcerated or in custody in any way I think she might have taken the leap and risked an appeal from the state and risked her decision being reversed if he had given her something to stand on yeah he didn't give him anything that was what was so frustrating about it she basically said habeas isn't going to work Mm -hmm. What else do you got? She didn't say, no, we're not doing this. And, right. and by the way, let's also clarify this. Did she ever at any point say there shall be no DNA testing? No. No, she didn't even get no. to the question. So when people say she denied testing, she that's didn't. just flat false. She denied the reason, she denied the, the, the vehicle they used to ask for the testing because it doesn't fit the law. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. What you're asking for requires an ambulance or you're driving a cement truck. I think from all the suggestions that she made, to me, it was clear that she has no problem with the evidence being tested. Did you not, did you get that same vibe from her? I, she never the very, said. The, the very fact that she was having a in-person hearing that so many people are talking about indicated that she felt that it was very likely the hurdles were going to be managed. Yeah. Now let's, let's talk about what she said at the end. Okay. When she said that she was denying their petition, she said that she held that hearing to be transparent. She did say that she had already, you know, she'd read the trial transcript. She knew the background. She had read all of, you know, the motion and all the replies to the motion, the original motion. And she had already decided this. What she had decided was that there were two hurdles they had to overcome to proceed. She had not decided that she was going to deny the motion. And that is what is being reported 
was that it was a foregone conclusion when they walked in that door that she was going to deny it. And that is not what happened. No, not even close. She, yeah. she did. She did not. That, that would be ridiculous. Why would she even have a hearing? I mean, that's that this woman is very smart, very fair, very articulate, very law conscious, like conscience con- can't talk. Um, <laughs> she it's late it's late at night so it's it, hard to sometimes it is get late at course. night but this is important um yeah. she the things the things that she had already decided were what the defense had to prove to move forward it, it had nothing to do with the she had already had not decided that she was going to deny their motion she had decided that these were the two things that needed to be resolved before the case could proceed yeah and i don't and think I, she i don't think she considered them to be even high hurdles i don't know i don't know what she considered them to be that was that was hard for me to read but that's what people are reporting and only are they saying that the judge denied dna testing which as we just said she did not do they're also saying that it was a sham hearing that she had already made up her mind that she was going to deny the motion and that's just not true there's no evidence of that. Yeah, None. there's no evidence of that at all. And, and I can't wait for the transcript to be available. Um, in fact, we called today to to see if it's available. It's not yet available, um, but we're going to get that. And I know a lot of other people are going to get that too. And I want people to be able, I mean, obviously it's words and it's a little different when, you know, you and I were there in the courtroom and, you know, we can see and hear and look at body language and all those things. It is a different experience, but the transcript will show what she said. Yes. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully it says it accurately and it should because they were professional as can be in that room. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I think there is a lot of misinformation out there and I, and I understand it. Like I under, I understand how disappointed the defense is and all of the supporters We're supporters too. We're also disappointed that it's going to take longer to have this evidence tested. Absolutely. I think what we wanted to bring to you is that there's a reason that that motion was denied and it's not because people are trying to stop Damien and Jason and Jesse from being exonerated or that nobody's interested in finding out who the real killer or killers are that's not what happened here yeah and I don't even think that was even brought up it, it wasn't but but that's how people are extrapolating from what they've heard from the very few people that were actually in the courtroom and oh yeah and, yeah, and running there's... running with it because they want to defend the three who were convicted. Well, so do we. We also believe that they're innocent, but we also know that if if they're granted something that's not legally sound, if the judge just says, if the judge decided to go on her feelings, let's say, let's pretend for a second she's a supporter. And she thought, I'm gonna grant this because nobody else has. And I think this testing needs to be done and I don't need a, I don't need a legal reason for that. And I'm just going to grant it. Do you think that'd get reversed? Yeah. Crespin would, <laughs> Crespin would have appealed that and blown, blown her career sky high. Her, her hands were tied and she gave suggestions on how to proceed. I don't yeah. know what else she could have done. Yeah. She said, and she, and, and let's get this clear. It was not a fast hearing. I mean, it was fast. How many minutes but, was it? You know, you wrote it down. Uh, 53 minutes. 53 we, we, minutes. We walked out at 10. She called, uh, it was all over at 10 50 or 10 23. And we started right at 10 30. So 53 minutes. Um, and I would say 50 minutes of that roughly was her trying to get the petitioner to give her a reason to get over that hurdle. Mm-hmm. And she wasn't sitting there saying, no, 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 denied. I've already made up my mind. She said, no, this, we're not going habeas. Give me another path there's got to be another path here. And she said, here are the legal pathways that I can see. Which one of these can you go through? And she brought up the idea, hey, if you got an agreement with Ellington, demonstrate that. Well, we have it in text messages. We have it in this and this. Do you have that in writing? Uh, no. I mean, so they're, that way is pe- shut. So do they have a piece of evidence that they want to go and they want to support that evidence with testing? Oh, no, we don't have that either. And she's- Litter- it, it was the most, it, it, and when that happened, your your jaw was kind of on the floor saying, you guys should have known. It was, I mean, Cressman told you that these were his objections. You needed to come in prepared to play ball. But they assumed that Cressman wasn't really going to put, they was going to put up kind of a paper fight 
but he he didn't have to because the judge was going to follow the law and we all knew we could see i mean yeah it stung it was disappointing when she said mm-hmm. i'm gonna have to uh, to deny it but at the same time she, did you ha- feel like she had any other choice i mean i'm a supporter do you feel like she had any choice no and i was gonna say i think literally <laughs> like maybe the only bone she didn't throw was she could have said the court's going to recess till after lunch regroup and we'll come back but i bet you that if mr binka had said just that like could we have a could we have a recess until and come back after lunch she probably would have granted it heck yeah but he didn't ask for it right yeah if he had said listen i can go and give me lunch give me an early lunch give me 90 minutes to comb through these records i will find a video i will download it and i will bring it in I bet you they would have been past hurdle one. And they or I'll find you some case law were. or something. <laughs> something, yeah. Something. And, you know, I mean, her, I, I feel like her hands were tied. But I think that there was also, like I said, there's a culture of the, of the prosecutor working with the defense teams to get routine testing done. And this is not, there's nothing, there's nothing routine about this case because they're so adversarial. Mm-hmm. and the uh i mean like i said this judge she came in i bet you she was up all night the night before that's my expectation she probably did, or didn't get much sleep um but honestly i i had a, i'll just go and say i had a lot of respect for her i felt like she she carried that that courtroom well given the amount of pressure and the amount of stress and the amount of notoriety that the case brought but also that the court hearing brought the media was trying to get in there um and of course, you know, you've got to consider and balance the, the issues of victims. You know, you know, Chris, mm-hmm. Chris Byer's uncle was sitting right there. She wanted to do the best job for everybody there. And the door is not shut to testing. I mean, that's just mm-hmm. ridiculous for them, for anybody to say that. That's just not so. Um, now, can they go and change the law? I think that's the hard way. I think that's the equivalent of buying an airline so that you can get free peanuts. <laughs> but... But I mean, it does have the greater good. I, I support that kind of change, but that's a hard change to get done because it's going to cost millions of dollars to the state to be able to fund that type of activity. So, you know, there, you know, there we are, you know, that's, that's how it was. And then we walked out at 1023. Yeah. I think, I think one of the main things I want to come back to is that she scheduled oral arguments for this hearing from my understanding the court calendar for her was scheduled for all day for this hearing you know the the entire day um and mr cressman brought an expert witness i think all of those things indicate that there was no foregone conclusion that they expected this to last much longer than it did that they expected to hear, you know, the, the scientific evidence that we all thought we were going to hear. I think there was an expectation by the state and the court that this was going to proceed much farther than it did. And, and, and probably get granted. Yes. And so I, um, the, the people who are saying that, you know, it was a sham, there was you know, she had already decided before she came in, it was a waste of everybody's time. I disagree. I think the evidence points to the fact that they thought that they were in this for the whole day, that there was going to be a long hearing for that day. And so I just, I don't, I don't know where that's coming from. And so I just want to point that out again, that I, there's no evidence that shows that any of that is true and if you had sat in that courtroom or if you do happen to know judge alexander or have observed her before she does not strike me as the type of woman that wastes anybody's time especially her own yeah absolutely and i guarantee (laughs) you she did not instruct for she did not put in all those court instructions for the seating of people and all the other stuff because she was intending to do any kind of harm to anybody she was in here to do the court hearing the way that the law prescribed. She followed the law. As she said, I completely agree with this. She did not instruct West Memphis PD to put on all that body armor and stand out in the heat right alongside all those, those supporters who were clearly agitated over the situation and were probably emotional after getting it denied. And then having that misinformation doused across them. You know, there, 
she was probably not, she's not the kind of person that's going to schedule a hearing for the express purposes of antagonizing people. Absolutely that is, not. That is ridiculous. And, you know, she, I, I, I think that there was nothing but, um, I think there was nothing but honest intentions on her behalf. And anybody who says anything otherwise is just really just peddling in emotionalism. It, that's all it is. Prior to the hearing, um, we were told, um, you know, at, at the group with um, George Byers that there would be limited seating in court. So I don't know how far in advance they had planned out the seating arrangements and how that would go and how many people they would let into the courtroom. But we were told that there would be very limited um, seating in the hearing. Yeah, that was that was kind of an open thing. And by the way, they were like I said, the police were wonderful, but I don't think that she wanted to put that the police department through that, uh, expend those resources, put all those miles on people flying in. Um, I don't think that she wanted to do that to supporters. I think she went there to go and do her job. She felt she was going to do the best job she could with the information she had. So let me just go ahead and say, I feel, and this is just my belief, I cannot get into the judge's mind, but I feel like she felt or she was operating on the premise that the petitioner was not exactly bringing their A game to that courtroom yeah. when they really absolutely should have brought their A game. I, I I agree. I think, like I said before, I think she was disappointed. I think she expected more. Um, she asked for more over and over in the courtroom um, and didn't get it. And I, I agree. I think she was, and contrary to what has been reported, she was not confrontational. She was direct, she was stern, and she did not want to waste people's time. It was hot outside. There were mm -hmm. officers that she, whose time she respects that she wants to make sure that they're safe as well. Her own safety was a big deal, obviously. She's got everybody socially distanced. And just by the way, on that social distancing thing, uh, it turns out that, that was prescient because um, uh, the, uh, a filmmaker, a uh, podcaster, actually went on... Um, social media and disclosed that he had COVID. So had he been in the, uh, in the courtroom and she wasn't doing the spreading or, or, or the social distancing and the mass, it's very likely you would have had a super spreader event. So we're grateful that she did that. Yeah. Cause we're both well. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. Me too. Um, let's talk a little bit about do you want to talk about the crowd and, and what, who was out there and what was going on? I don't want to get into some of the social dynamics. There was some, uh, stuff out there that I, I don't really want to get into uh, about that but I do want to talk about the crowd and and how supportive they were and how wonderful they were I know that they they did not recognize George Byers walking out which was kind of interesting Mark Byers of course if he was walking across that courtyard everybody would have yeah. recognized him he's he just stands right out yeah um, but George Byers he walked out um, and he's a tall very tall man uh, like just Mark like his was. brother was, mm -hmm. uh, he's 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 a force that you can recognize, but he's very humble. Mm. He's he has a very quiet demeanor. He's soft spoken. Very soft spoken, but he but he carries force with him. I mean, mm -hmm. he doesn't need to speak loudly, as Mark did. He's a he's a, in many ways the exact opposite of Mark, and to be able to see George Byers and Jason Baldwin have a really wonderful conversation and be able to observe that, uh, I mean that that by itself made the entire trip worth doing. It was a beautiful moment. Yeah, it was still pretty, makes me wildly great. like cry. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the, in fact, Jason, when we walked out, Jason Baldwin, uh, the first person we saw was Jason Baldwin and they, they took to each other. Uh, they hadn't seen each other in many years and they took to each other right away. And uh, I'm glad to see that they are friends still. Yeah. It was, they, I thought the atmosphere, now we didn't spend any time out there on our way in. We just walked through the crowd um, to the courthouse because we, they were ready to seat us. So we were, yeah, we were expected. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, they'd given us a time that we would to be seated. And so we, we just went straight to the courthouse, but um, afterwards, you know, everybody was milling around outside and they still had their rules up that we couldn't be in that first parking lot closest to the courthouse. Um, we had to stay in that second parking lot, um, which we had stopped when um, George and, and Jason started talking. We had stopped in that parking lot. A police officer came over and asked us to, to move and he was very nice about it. He wasn't pushy or anything, but um, you know, we stood there and, and talked, we got, spoke with, with Jason for a while and his business, his business partner and 
you know, the, at that point, all the, the news was going through the crowd because we had just exited the courtroom. Um, so everybody was finding out that the motion had been denied. And so um, there was some disappointment for sure. Um, there was I didn't anger. hear it was angry. There was a lot of anger, angry feelings, especially amongst those that had been in the courtroom. Yes. Um, I, I did hear Mara Leverett kind of briefing the crowd on what happened. I could say that I, she gave a fairly, probably the most accurate, immediate, you know, discussion of what happened to the crowd, but she left out certain failures on behalf of the petitioner. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, and I think that kind of has predicated or has, has kind of nucleated a lot of these uh, conversations that are happening on social media and that are getting people really riled up. And, and the, I think one of the reasons why we wanted to film this or to, to record this for people to listen to was to counteract that, to say, your anger is not helping the situation. I mean, your passion is important and anger, anger can be a manifestation of passion, but your passion needs to be towards um, seeking to make sure these people are well-funded making sure that they have the resources they need to get the testing done, to make sure that they have the legal representation that they need to get the testing done, and to make sure that everybody is on board with the safety protocols, there's no doxing going on, that it needs to be an uplifting and positive thing at this point. It can't be, you know, all the, all the nastiness. It can't be the bullying that has to stop because that's why we're here. That's, that, there would have been no hearing this would have just gone through two years ago. We would already probably know the results. Yeah. If people just would stop treating each other so poorly. And, you know, I mean, I can get into the other stuff. I mean, this, the people that are interested in the case, just the, the observers, you got the non-supporters and the supporters and they treat each other so poorly. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, we could talk about that maybe in another episode. I mean, some of the stuff the non-supporters have written is just so harebrained and crazy that, you know, they say, oh, we had a friend inside the, uh, I saw somebody post this. I had a friend that was inside the, the courtroom and they reported this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this big long diatribe. And you're reading it like, no, that's not what happened. Um, what, what's the truth is very different. And, you know, and I think that we're trying to just get that information out, just to put some ice on the situation to realize there was a severe malfunction on behalf of how they pursued it rather than the judge coming in and being biased or corrupted part of the system and that she colluded with the prosecutor and she's colluding with her with her predecessors and she's just a big problem this is a woman that has not a single she displayed not a single bone of that and i think it's unfair to labor label her that way i feel that people treated ellington very poorly i granted ellington at the end i don't i do not approve of the way that he walked out on all that stuff he shouldn't have done that but at the same time um <laughs> When you, when you take him on national media and you destroy his reputation and then you wonder why he's suddenly his predator or his successor is coming in saying, oh, you want, to, you want some of this? Okay, yeah. I'll see you in court. And they're yeah. fighting over stupid stuff. I mean, it's not stupid. It's just, a, it's, this shouldn't have happened. Well, this you know, no, it shouldn't have. But the interesting thing to me over the past couple of years about all of this is who shouldn't want the DNA testing done? Let's see. Supporters should want it done. Non-supporters should want it done. The only person who doesn't want it done are people or the killer or killers, right? So that's a yes. couple people. Yeah. Everybody else that's interested in this case should want this testing done. Everybody. So let's not fight about it. Let's get it done somehow let's th there's got to be a way to get it done and i i mean changing the law is great because it will help people in the future it's not just going to help damien and jason and jesse because the law i think does need to change in arkansas i think the judge thinks the law in arkansas needs to change um but but it's silly all this fighting and people being happy that the that the motion was denied that's ridiculous everybody should want this dna tested everybody yeah. Unless, unless you committed those murders, unless you killed Stevie and Michael and Christopher, you should want this testing done. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the judge didn't seem to have, she expressed no concerns about the testing. She just wanted mm -hmm. to make sure that it met the legal requirements of the state of Arkansas that guarantee that has been time tested to guarantee the rights of all people, including the victims 
uh, in this process. And she, she adhered to that. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's unfortunate that people are saying the things that they're saying because and, it's, 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 it's really causing problems. And before I forget, there have been some, I have seen it's mentioned a couple places on social media, but the day of the hearing would have been Christopher's birthday. Um, and we talked about that with George and Jason after the hearing and um, it was very touching. But for those people out there who didn't know, it wasn't just a day for a hearing. It was also Christopher's birthday. Yeah, Christopher's birthday. And Chris, and it was kind of touching that Christopher Byers, his uncle, yeah. was having a nice long conversation with Jason Baldwin about seeing things forward, that there was the heat, that they feel that there's still a chance ahead of them despite this setback. You know, mm -hmm. George wanted the testing, I yeah. think, granted. I think everybody wants it done. I think Cressman... I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say he's being motivated by ego or any of these other things, but, you know, he has a duty. He, it's within his purview to do the, these things and he's doing them and what's motivating it is up to him. But I will tell you, I, I seriously do think that the horrible bullying, and it, it has been horrible. We, let's not pull punches on this. It's not like they said ugly things about me on national TV. This is not what they're talking about. We're talking about uh, death threats and things like this. Um, the Twitter account coming down because it was just nasty, absolutely nasty what was coming through there. Um, you know, I, I just don't see at some point Cressman is going to defend the institution. He's going to defend his office. Um, and this is kind of the, you got to draw a line, you know? And so that's the problem is this stuff has, has to stop. And I'm not saying Patrick Banka was engaged in this at all. I, I, I don't see any evidence that Patrick Banka was involved in this. <laughs> Um, he seemed like a really cordial, he was a nice, he was a nice guy. Uh, he was articulate, he was intelligent, he was quick on his feet, but he was, he just seemed like he wasn't prepared, at least not for this. And he should have been. This is, this was just kind of a big mistake. Yeah, I think it was just an argument he wasn't prepared for. Um, you know, I, I have, I have read a little bit about him, about his background, and he seems to be a popular attorney, well-respected um, for what he does. And so I, I expected more, but I think it was just, uh, I literally think it was that they were not expecting the judge to bring this up. So they were not prepared to argue this point because they were not expecting it. Yeah. you have any final thoughts on this? Nope. I think... I think that's it. I think that there are ways forward. Um, and I think what different people are going to explore those differently. We have, we have different, different avenues, different ways to, to move forward. So it'll be interesting to see all the routes different people take. Yeah. The door's not closed on testing. The, the door's not even closed on this question of whether it's habeas or not. I mean, it sounds like Damien's group is going to go and pursue this habeas thing, hell or high water. I mean, it's 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 not how I would go about it, but that's how they've decided they're going to do it. Um, and then, of course, there's other players. Um, I frequently referred to Jason Baldwin as being the sleeping giant in all of this. He has he has the ability to make to play cards. Um, he hasn't done it yet. Um, I don't know why he hasn't. I haven't spoken to him about his, these things. I've just only had kind of a quick personal conversation with him uh, in the presence of Mr. Byers. Um, and he was a very kind, uh, he was a very kind person. He has a very warm smile. If you ever get the chance to say hi to him or to, or to drop him a note on Twitter or something like that, he's, he's a very kind guy. Um, so I just wanted to say that. I mean, it's, I, I don't know where this is gonna go, um, but the door isn't closed. And I, I would be frustrated if I saw that they continue to pursue a very hard route when the judge said, there are these easier routes. Let's go these easier routes. And then we'll go on to the second hurdle. And by the way, I, I want to bring this up also, is this is not the end of this, right? I mean, if, if you're Keith Cressman at this point, who's clearly digging in, um, he's going to make them fight for it. He's going to make it expensive. He's going to make it difficult for them. Um, whether that's what he should be doing or not is a different issue. That's a decision he's made. It's his legal right to do so. Um, he was going to fight that hurdle. And then there's a second one. He was going to fight that one. And then they were going to get into the question of whether or not this was a scientifically viable method. He was going to fight that one. I mean, he had Kermit Channel sitting right there. Kermit Channel is no joke. 
Um, so he was going to put up a, some type of response that was going to be pretty articulate, strong, and put together by people that the state of Arkansas trusts. Um, and he was probably going to try and blow holes in the system, in, into the situation, into the arguments. So it, this was in no way, shape, or form going to be a, well, if we had just gotten past that, then we would have gotten DNA. That, that was not even close to the case. But likely, it would have. Likely would have wound up with that conclusion. But it would, it would have been a hard day. It would have been a hard day for both sides. And I was looking forward to it. And it's unfortunate we couldn't even get past the first hurdle. Got an early lunch. We had an unfortunately early lunch. Well, I had a great <laughs> early lunch. I mean, hanging out with George Byers is always a treat. But, um, you know, it's not the way that you want to be sitting there talking about why it all blew up and, and watching supporters be extremely distraught. They were upset. I, wouldn't, nobody, I didn't see anybody crying or anything like that, but they were clearly unhappy. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I did watch uh, Damien give an interview briefly. Um, there were, like I said, there were documentary film crew makers walking around. There was media all over the place. And then we dispersed. Again, the police were great. Everybody was kind and everybody was safe. Ultimately, everybody was safe. And that was, that was what came out of that. I think it was really important. And the law was preserved. So I, they just need to fix, they need to fix the defects in their argument. I think they would have had it.